Welcome everybody to another observability clinic. It's in the season Dynatrace apps spotlight. We're putting the spotlight on the monitoring coverage sample app. It's really a great app that you all have access to, but the best is it really shows you how and what possibilities you have with the Dynatrace platform. And uh, I have Lucas Hocker here with me, product lead of infrastructure monitoring. Hi, Lucas. How are you? Hi, Andy. Hey, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I think this is going to be a great to show us an app, but really show us uh, how we went about building this app and how others, people, our customers and partners can build their own apps, kind of following our best practices. And also, I think the app that you're going to show us today is actually fully available on GitHub. So everybody can fork the app and see how we build this and then learn from this. Um, and I, th I think I haven't said enough. Uh, Lucas, please uh, go ahead. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so what we're going to learn today, um, you know, essentially how to tackle any monitoring problem right from within Dynatrace. Uh, so we'll take kind of take three steps. So first, kind of formulate your problem. Um, you know, is the answer already in Dynatrace somewhere? Uh, then explore with notebooks and DQL. Mm -hmm. I think you've already done a, a performance clinic on DQL before. Mm -hmm. uh, and then take action with App Engine. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that'll be kind of the main focus here, but. You know, kind of this three-step process, I think, is a great way to, um, you know, take any problem you might have and address that with Dynatrace, even if it's a use case that we don't address out of the box. Mm -hmm. Cool. So figure out, do I have the data already in Dynatrace? And maybe there's already an out-of-the-box solution to that problem that you want to solve. Then, you know, you don't need to go down the path of building something yourself, but formulate the problem, figure out if the data is there explore it with notebooks and DQL, how you can actually get the exact data that you need and then figure out how, and if it makes sense to build an app around it to just automate, you know, the way you access the data and the way you analyze it. Yeah, Cool. Exactly. So for the monitoring coverage app, uh, we started with a problem. So, you know, how do I know if I have 100% coverage across my entire environment? Um, you know, if I do have monitoring gaps, how can I close them quickly? So our solution here was to, to query Smartscape. Mm -hmm. uh, Smartscape you know, already has a ton of information about what's in your environment and how it's related. Uh, then we wanted to visualize the results. And then finally, we wanted to allow the user to take action quickly. So that's kind of the, the, the focus there. Does that mm -hmm. make sense so far? It, it makes perfect sense. And it's also a great way to explain the use case. So folks, you know, if you we enable everyone to build apps on Dynatrace platform. That means if you build an app, whether it's on Dynatrace or any type of app in the world, you always want to solve a problem with this app. So that's why I really like it, how you phrase it. What is the actual problem that you want to solve? And in your case, from an observability perspective, you want to figure out, do we have 100% coverage of all the environments? And if not, then where are the gaps? And let's build an app that shows me by querying the existing data that we have on what is covered and what is not covered and then make it easy to fill the gaps with uh, with the actions that you had that here. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Exactly. So with that said, let, let's do a quick demo. Mm -hmm. So this is the monitoring coverage app uh, that's been deployed to our demo environment. Mm -hmm. um, all of our sample apps at Dynatrace have some additional language up here. So if you stumble across the app, uh, it kind of you know, tells you what the app is for, what it demonstrates. Uh, and also has links to um, GitHub as well as the developer portal um, also here as well. Mm -hmm. So in the, the main portion of the app here, we can see the four different clouds that we have uh, for our environment. Um, you'll notice that the app starts in demo mode. So this is just some, some dummy data. You see nice round numbers of 1000 cloud hosts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and this really allows any user uh, with the app to get a feel for how it works, what it does, um, you know, whether you want to install one agents, you want to connect the cloud. Hmm. When you're in demo mode, all of those things are, are just mocked up and it just kind of gives you dummy, dummy data and, you know, kind of shows you what it would do. Now, when we switch out of demo mode, it's actually running DQL against our environment, and it's actually connected to uh, the actual SDKs, which allow us to make changes in the environment as well. So here you can see the numbers are, are not quite as pretty as what we have uh, in demo mode. Uh, we can see here that for AWS, uh, we do have a cloud connection there, 
And from that cloud connection, we know about 11 uh, EC2 instances out there. From one agent, we know that there's 1,500 uh, hosts that we're monitoring that are in AWS. So here we know we have a, a critical gap because we're monitoring more things than we know about. So this this means that you know th there could be an even bigger problem out there of we don't even know what needs to be monitored. So this is where you know the app is recommending that we connect to a cloud first. So here uh, this would. Uh, very similar to the settings screen, give us all the prompts we would need to create that cloud connection. So we could say this is uh, Lucas's AWS. Uh, we could put in some uh, mm -hmm. different data for our account. That's just uh, kind of junk data. Um, but when I click connect here, uh, it will actually um, call the SDK mm -hmm. um, for the app and it should create that cloud connection. Uh, and you can see once to save passwords and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that'll create that new connection. And over time, it once it connects and knows more about uh, that environment, you would be able to um, see this, this number of clouds go up. Mm -hmm. You can see for other clouds, uh, we're also highlighting different scenarios as well. Mm -hmm. So for Azure, we have that connection already there, and we know about 22 Azure VMs, but none of those have uh, one agents installed. So we could expand this and we could actually see here's the different Azure VMs. Um, here are contextual links to take you to the host screen for those, uh, but here are also the IP addresses for them. Now, if we want to install one agent on those, uh, you'll see uh, an install one agent screen, which looks very similar to our deploy screen. Mm -hmm. One key difference here is that we give you all those IP addresses and enable you to copy and paste them. So, you know, no matter what automation system you're using to you know, roll out one agents, whether it's something simple like SSH or you have Ansible, Chef, or Puppet, uh, you can copy and paste this list of IP addresses in. Uh, pick the other options, uh, mm -hmm. copy the, the download one-liner, and then copy the install one-liner. Uh, again, kind of taking the already easy process and making it just a little bit easier by giving you that list of IP addresses that we mm -hmm. know needs to be uh, a one agent installed there. Mm -hmm. And so as you install those, uh, this will go up as well. Mm -hmm. So we could actually flip back to demo mode and just kind of see that in action. So here in demo mode, we don't have an Azure. We would type in some information. We'd click connect. And you can see that that's now connected. Now we know how many um, hosts are there. And you know as this uh, coverage rate goes up, uh, we can see for VMware, you know, this is a high priority. We're only at 40% monitored. That's Pretty big gap. So if we copied and we went and installed those one agents, mm -hmm. magically we came back and now all 500 are installed. So you get the green 100%. And once all these are at 100%, you know your environment is totally covered and you have no moderate gaps. That's really cool. I mean, for me, there's a couple of things I want to I want to recap here. First of all, as a best practice, when we build apps, I think it should be a best practice that you have a demo mode in there because then you can easily show your app that you built uh, without maybe needing to go to the live data. Just um, I think it's great for for pitching uh, the app and, and also kind of uh, test the flow because you are basically, as you're working with the app, it seems you were then also updating the demo data and to really show how the workflows are. So that's great. But in general, I really like the use case of this particular app because it solves, even though it's a sample app and everybody can, can use it and download it, um, but it already shows and solves the problem that many of our users have because they want to make sure that they have the right coverage in uh, their environments. And you basically make it easy to have one spot show them where do you have gaps and then you give them the actions to either connect to the cloud vendor where we are pulling in data from AWS CloudWatch, from Azure, Google or VM, or install one agents to, to get the, the full stack monitoring coverage. Really nicely done. And 
And the cool thing is all this is available as a sample app. That means you can clone it. You can see um, what actually happens behind the scenes because the app itself, I would assume, and I know you're going to show this, it's going to access Smartscape data. It's going uh, to access uh, the SDKs because you actually make configuration changes in Dynatrace as you are mm -hmm. you know, connecting uh, to the clouds. Um, I'm sure you're also, you know, maybe querying some additional data through DQL, but yeah, uh, really, really great sample app. Um, and, yeah. and, but with a real practical use case already, even though if you just install it yourself and, 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 and play with it. Yeah. Well, one, one more thing that I love about it, it, you know, this kind of process was already possible. So you could use the Dynatrace APIs mm -hmm. and you could, you know, do these things in your automation system. Mm -hmm. But now just having a, a button you can click on mm -hmm. uh, to see 100% and, and automate some of these things, you know, makes it just that much easier. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, even if you don't have a very robust automation system that you're using for lots of different things, now you can create a simple app that, uh, you know, does those things for you. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is missing from my perspective is going to be a big badge in the top that says, you are like if a green badge and green means more than ninety percent coverage and the red badge or something like this, uh, kind of getting the uh, the coverage or the priority more higher up in the middle. People like badges, right? Or it's whatever you want to call them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think one of one of the key thing to remember is that I'm just a product manager yeah. and uh, you know not a professional developer and not a professional UX person. So, you know. What you'll see in, uh, you know, real Dynatrace apps versus sample apps, uh, mm -hmm. you know, should be even cooler. Yep. So let's let's talk a little bit about how this actually works. So first, just a quick refresher on Smartscape. Uh, I think most people have been around Dynatrace long enough and, and know that you know this is part of the secret sauce of Dynatrace and why uh, Dynatrace is so powerful. But let's let's just look at it for a second to see, you know, what is Dyna or what is Smartscape really. Uh, so first off, uh, Smartscape uh, exists uh, based on entities. So you know anything that we monitor uh, is in Smartscape. So application, services, processes, hosts, data centers, on and on and on. And all of those different entities also include all their different properties, all the different tags, all the different metadata. So all of that is in Smartscape in real time uh, there. But also importantly, we have all these relationships. So we, we generally look at it in terms of vertical relationships. So this process runs on a particular host and horizontal relationships. So this service calls that service. So when we put these things together, uh, we call this Smartscape. So it's a near real-time topology for your entire environment. Uh, it's populated by one agent, but also through all the other ingest channels that we have into Dynatrace as well. So think about things like open telemetry, or if you're just ingesting metrics, uh, that also creates a, an entity as well. Uh, and also extensions. So we have uh, several hundred extensions out there for different types of technologies that you can monitor. And when you install those extensions, it also creates uh, entities and their relationships in Smartscape. And really this is you know, what enables Davis to provide you know, here's the root cause. You know, we're not just looking at, you know, this metric correlates with this metric. So we, you know, show you those together. Um, but having this topology of how all the things are interconnected really allows Davis to use that for causation. And one, one thing that a lot of customers haven't really utilized in the past is being able to use Smartscape for a whole bunch of other purposes. So you could query Smartscape via the API for a long time. Uh, lots of customers did that, but now you can also query it via DQL, uh, which makes it so much easier. Does that all make sense? Yeah, makes sense. And um, I think what I really uh, liked about this that you also explained that Smartscape is not just something that we get through our one agent, uh, but especially also through all of our open ingest APIs, whether it's open telemetry or any of the metrics ingests. So that's great. And having it accessible and queryable through the API and DQL as well, just makes it so much easier accessible, yeah. So, so most people are familiar with the Smartscape screen and you know each of these bubbles that are over here on the side, uh, each of those is an entity. So you can see the vertical relationships uh, on the left. So this service 
um, exists on these 10 processes, which exists on 10 hosts, which exists on three data centers. And you can see the horizontal process, uh, horizontal relationships as well. On the right, so this service calls that service, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So now that we know what Smartscape is, you know, how can we use that for our own purposes? We know that Davis is using it behind the scenes to come up with you know, root cause and all of these things. Um, but how can how can we use it ourselves? So we start with notebooks. So in um, the new Dynatrace experience, notebooks is a, a core application that's provided with the platform. And it really allows you to explore all the data that exists in Grail. Um, so you can do a bunch of different uh, types of DQL queries. Mm -hmm. So the Dynatrace query language is, is how we get data um, out of Dynatrace or how we query that data. Mm -hmm. So a couple commands to, to, to learn right away. So describe is a good one to understand uh, you know, what something is. So if you want to describe a metric or you want to describe an entity, uh, that will give you uh, all the different fields uh, that exist there. Fetch is the main command to, to actually get the data. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you can see on the right, we're fetching uh, EC2 instances. So that's a, a type of entity that exists in Smartscape. When you want to connect different things together, I uh, use the command called lookup. Mm -hmm. uh, so we look up different relationships. So in this case, we're looking at uh, this runs relationship between an EC2 instance, so something we know about through the cloud integration, and this host entity, so something we know about via one agent. So you know, we can already start to think about you know, how monitoring coverage is doing this by looking at here's all of the EC2s, here's all of the one agents, filter those one agents by which ones are um, in AWS, mm -hmm. if we want that full list, um, you know, the DQL will give us that. If we want to then summarize it to know how many there are, uh, the summarize command allows you to do that um, with different counts or averages or max or min or all of those types of aggregation functions as well. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you're already thinking through a bunch of different ways you could use this. Um, you know, how many EC2s don't have a one agent? Mm -hmm. Which ones? Um, you know, how many one agent hosts are in AWS. So there's a number of different ways that uh, you can query all sorts of information out of uh, Smartscape. Uh, and, and it's not just simply, you know, the entities and their relationships. Also think about all the properties, the tags, the metadata that exists on them as well. Mm -hmm. So once you really start exploring, uh, you know, what's actually there in Smartscape with notebooks, uh, there's a ton of cool things you can do with it. So let's take a quick demo with this. So this is the Notebooks app. Um, if you start with the uh, launcher in the new experience, then you'll see Notebooks as the very first icon. So here we can see a number of different queries that I, I've tried and the different results that came back. Um, so notebooks is a, a great way to try things out. Uh, if I want to share, you know, what I found, I can share that with other people uh, in Dynatrace. Um, notebooks can even, you know, even has different snippets for, you know, what does a query look like to to get recent logs, or what what does a query look like to get uh, metrics or events or things like this. Uh, and we'll add entities here very soon as well. So that's, uh, we'll give you, you know, some, some queries to start with. Um, so, so really, you can do all of these queries to understand what's in Smartscape, but you can even run code directly from notebooks as well. So you wouldn't even have to create an app if, you know, you were the only one doing it and you just wanted to, to automate it one time. You could just run the code right in, um, in notebooks and you know access the SDK and make those changes if you have appropriate permissions. So let's just get started with a, a quick uh, describe. So we talked about dt.entity.ec2 instance. 
So if we run this, we can see all the different fields that exist. So um, yeah, we can see the ID for it. We can see the entity name, the different tags that exist, management zones, yeah. on and on and on and on. So there's 37 different uh, fields on EC2 instance. We want to describe host. So that, again, this is the, the entity that we know from one agent. Again, we see 97 different fields. So all of these are different things that we can query, we can use to group, we can use uh, to, to look up different um, relationships between these. And it's not just limited to just entities. You could also mix and match and say, you know, give me the average CPU usage for these particular set of hosts. Mm -hmm. Or give me all the hosts that have an average CPU usage above 90%. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of uh, really powerful ways that you can explore the data uh, with DQL. Mm -hmm. And and Lucas, just uh, one thing to mention here. All of this is possible for the power of DQL, our Dynage with query language. And if folks want to learn more about DQL, we have already, uh, we had a clinic uh, on DQL. I'm sure there will be more, but there's also great documentation and examples, especially not only how to query one particular piece of observability data, like your metrics uh, or as you said, your entities, but also how you can connect them and how you actually really do the nice query. I and mean, you brought some great examples, like give me the list of hosts where we have, let's say, a very high CPU utilization over a certain period of time because this might be hosts that you want to take a quick look at. Or the reverse one would be a nice one too, where you say, give me all the hosts where over the last seven days we had very small utilization and maybe they are good candidates to be optimized away, right? Who knows? Not exactly. Yeah, perfect. So we talked about describe and that's probably the first one to know as you're getting started. Mm -hmm. The second is fetch. So this will simply get me a list of all of the hosts. Mm -hmm. um, our dev environment here is somewhat large. Uh, so automatically it sets a limit of uh, 1,000. Uh, if we wanted more than that, uh, you can obviously change the limit command and say get 10,000 or 100,000, know, however big your environment is. Um, we talked about filter. So filter is how we um, filter the, the data set down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, we won't go too deep into the DQL because I know you have a, another performance clinic on that, mm -hmm. um, but just wanted to give you a, a quick overview of all the, the things we can do here. Um, and we can see some of the other commands that I've already written as well. So mm -hmm. here's the, the one looking at EC2 instances and adding a relationship here uh, to hosts. And then we filter out, uh, so, so we do a lookup uh, for which hosts are connected with those EC2 instances. And then we provide that list back. Mm -hmm. So you can see the result set includes the ID of the EC2 instance. Um, as well as the uh, the name of the, the VMs as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. Very straightforward, yeah, and really powerful, and really shows that you know you can really access all of the data, and you can notebooks are really great to explore to kind of like figure out what data do you have, and what can you do with the data. And then, as you said, right, if you're comfortable, if this is just for you, maybe you just stick with that notebook, maybe share it with somebody else. But if you want to then open up the use case further to more people easier the people that are not familiar with dql and don't want to mess around with clicking the run button all the time i guess this is then also where apps come in exactly so let's jump back over to our presentation so if we want to learn about apps um, you know how how can i get started uh, if you go to dynatrace.dev uh, that will take you to our developer portal uh, there's a lot of great information on how to create apps, there's a quick start guide, uh, there's different videos you can watch, uh, there's references for all of the Strato components, so the visualizations to, to use in the application, as well as all the SDKs for, for how you can take action with your, your application. 
and there's the Dynatrace developer community as well. Um, so as we've been starting with apps internally, um, you know, the uh, platform enablement team has pushed us over to, to use community. So you can see a lot of questions that we've already asked internally there mm -hmm. as well, uh, and, and not using your internal chat or things like that instead. So all of that, uh, that knowledge is, is already uh, out there on the community and growing. Uh, so if you have questions, ask, uh, ask a question. If you know the answer to somebody else's question, feel free to answer it. Um, so both of these are really powerful ways to, to learn about apps and um, you know continue that education as you go. Mm -hmm. So if we want to create our first app uh, within the developer portal, uh, click on getting a quick start. And you can just kind of follow the bouncing ball there uh, as you go through. Another option is to start with a, a sample app, such as monitoring coverage. Uh, look it up on GitHub, click on fork, and then you have all the source code right on your desktop. You can run it, you can change it, uh, all of those different things. So let's do a quick demo of both of these as well. So we flip over to uh, the developer portal under getting started and quick start. You can watch a little video on how to do it, or you can just uh, go down through a couple different steps here. Um, here, we're just going to pick our environments. We have the right one. We'll copy and paste uh, a one-line command, and we'll flip over to a terminal. Uh, I like to keep all of my apps and stuff in the projects folder. Mm -hmm. uh, so I copy the one-liner. This will actually um, you know, start um, this create.js, uh, which creates the, the application for you. So we'll call this one, let's call it like Lucas test. So this will get all the dependencies and it's going to, to actually build uh, the app on uh, my laptop here. Uh, so this takes uh, one or two minutes, hopefully. And this is uh, Lucas. What this does here, right? It it basically creates uh, an, a new app, a new sample app, really based on a very basic template. I think that we have mm -hmm. in there that just shows uh, how to do, you know, how you how you start with the app, how you build one, how you uh, how you run it, how you push it, and from I know this is going to download now all the packages in case you have not downloaded it. Uh, any other things that application developers now should be should be having locally, what do they need? I think I see Node.js, right? They need Node.js. That's the thing, pretty much anything that, I mean, that's all they really need. Obviously we suggest having a good IDE, maybe Visual Studio Code or whatever you uh, you prefer, uh, but that's actually it, uh, we're done. Yeah, I, I prefer VS Code, but uh, you, know, you can use whatever you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, so now it's created the app and uh, we just follow the instructions here. So we're going to change directories to my newly created project. Um, you can see that it's already created that as a, a Git repository as well. So you could do like get status, everything's clean. Mm -hmm. And let's actually run the application. Now, when you say run the application, we are building, we, we have local source code now. Um, and what, what does it do? So the local source code, uh, runs in Node.js on my laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll notice that the URL in the, the browser window that popped up is actually the dev environment that I'm connected to. Mm -hmm. So this is the dev environment I'm connected to, and it's proxying from my browser just to the, the local port. Uh, so all of that is is very safe and very easy. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know we're able to query the data in the environment. Um, with DQL, uh, run SDKs and all of that, uh, but the actual front end code is, is running on my laptop. Mm -hmm. So that's, and again, what folks, what you see here is uh, the tutorial app, the getting started tutorial app that Lucas just uh, kind of created locally in his environment and with NPM start, it runs locally, but it automatically connects to the Dynatrace environment, which means the UI itself is visualized as if you would have installed that app on your Dynatrace tenant. Um, but the code, obviously, because you're still developing it, everything runs locally, it's just proxying through, which as you said, 
it gives you a lot of freedom. That means you don't need to install any app already on your environment, on your tenant, but you can play around with it locally until you're comfortable and then uh, at, at a later time push it, yeah? Yep, exactly. And if we go out to my projects folder and I see Lucas test, uh, just opening that folder in VS Code mm -hmm. shows you, you know, here's all of the, the application components. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can see you know, what the app looks like. And this was the data page we were just looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so if we wanted to change the setting here or the, the heading, and let's just say, welcome to our performance clinic. It's called Observability Clinic. We, we rebranded it a while I'm ago. Sorry. That's okay. But you know, you're a developer now and you can change this on the fly. Yep. And we save. Now should automatically refresh our browser and Ooh. you can wow, see cool. that you know that my code is 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 running there. I so think you should apply. Cool. I think you should uh, consider a career as a developer. Forget the product management stuff <laughs> and just become an app developer. Yeah, we, we, we'll see. We, <laughs> we'll, we'll see on that one. Yeah. Cool. So. So, so this is how we would do the getting started. Now, what if we want to you know, use a, a sample app? So let's go back over to our developer portal and you'll see a section called sample apps. So you can see there's several of them out here already. Uh, so monitoring coverage gives you a little overview of it mm -hmm. and gives you the link to GitHub. Mm -hmm. So here's the GitHub repository. Um, at the moment, it's private, but uh, as of uh, the platform GA, that, that all becomes public. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to fork this one and um, either just use the app or you want to contribute changes to it or you want to adapt it for your own purposes, mm -hmm. you can just click fork and uh, you can um, create, you create your fork mm -hmm. in your GitHub account. So now I'm in Lucas Hacker slash monitoring coverage instead of Dynatrace slash monitoring coverage. Mm -hmm. so this is my own one. And if I want to um, you know, clone that to my desktop, we just copy the link there. Uh, we'll come back to my projects folder. I don't want to uh, actually overwrite my actual project that exists. So let's uh, now put it right in there. We'll do git clone and we'll paste uh, what came from GitHub. Mm -hmm. And this is just gonna clone everything that was there. Mm -hmm. And if we then CD into monitoring coverage, you can see all of the, the files are there, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if we want to NPM run start, Uh, you might need to do npm install first to make sure all mm -hmm. the dependencies are installed. Mm -hmm. And so the dependencies now, obviously, right, all the dependencies are not checked in into, into the Git repository, which makes a lot of sense. So it's not downloading all of the, the package, uh, the dependencies based in the package JSON. So folks, this is just if you're not, uh, you know, have never developed uh, apps, node, node apps. This is just a general procedure. Um, also, what I wanted to highlight here is that um, if you want to learn more about all of this, right, that's obviously the developer portal, that's great. But then uh, we will have additional material. Uh, we'll also do dedicated observability clinics on uh, on, on App Engine. Um, so folks, if you're, if you're watching this and you want to learn more, then uh, make sure that you check out all of the other resources we have, starting in the developer portal, in the community, um, and on a YouTube channel and on university. Cool. So now we can see our local version of monitoring coverage. Well, we can obviously change and adapt all of those things as well. Uh -huh. So I have a question. So again, now. This is how does how does fun. how does your so you just cloned an application or you cloned your Git repository? That means your local NB NPM or your local configuration knows uh, to which Dynatrace environment 
uh, you're connected to? So you may need to adapt that. So let's uh, open that folder. So that was in temp and then monitoring coverage. Mm -hmm. So here's our um, application mm -hmm. and the app config.ts is where um, it controls which environment it's pointed to. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so this is pointed to my dev environment, mm -hmm. um, but you can change that to your environment when it points to your environment. Perfect. I think that's a good. And I think I'm pretty sure this is also all documented in the uh, getting started guide with, with uh, demo apps. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Also in the, the readme for the monitor coverage. Oh yeah, well. perfect. Yeah, perfect. Cool. So this this actually takes you through you know how to start it, mm -hmm. uh, but also takes you through the DQL queries that we explored in uh, notebooks as well. Mm -hmm. So you can follow that whole thing here as well. Oh. And and as you said, right, the, the sample app, the monitoring coverage sample app really does a lot of things. It it queries data, it shows you how to use some of our UI components, um, like the table that you had, the buttons, like the lists in the tables, you have a lot of these uh, components already in uh, in this sample lab. And there's so many more, um, yeah, exactly. We call it the Strato design systems where you really have everything that you see in the Dynatrace user interface is basically also available for you if you're building a custom Dynatrace app. And that's, yep. that's, that's really, really nice. Um, in the source code, we also show you obviously how you can access the Dynatrace data through DQL, how you can make configuration changes through the Dynatrace SDKs that are available to every app developer. Yeah, that, it's yep. broad coverage. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm happy. I'm sold. <laughs> all right, well, that's good. Yeah, because I'm all over slides. Yeah. So you know, just to review what we talked about today. You know, really now with, with uh, the new Dynatrace experience, you can really tackle any sort of monitoring problem that might crop up. Um, you know, three simple steps, you know, formulate the problem, you know, what kind of data might I need? Is it already in Dynatrace or do I need to ingest some additional data into Dynatrace? Uh, explore that data using notebooks and DQL. And then finally take action with App Engine. Mm -hmm. uh, so a couple of links here. Uh, so Dynatrace.dev, Again, that takes you to the dev portal on how to get started. And then the uh, sample app, which is also linked here, um, is on GitHub as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Lucas, thank you so much. I know there is uh, more to come because we're just getting started on this journey with all of the new capabilities we brought to the Dynatrace platform. Today, we covered the monitoring coverage sample app. The idea with this was really to also unleash your ideas of building your own Dynatrace app by actually learning right, on how we build our reference apps. So the sky is the limit. We're not limited to our classical, let's say, monitoring and observability use cases. You already showed a great use case with you know, what do we have covered and what is not covered and then expand. Uh, but folks, think about any type of data can now be managed in Dynatrace, whether it's your classical infrastructure, your application data, your real user data, your business data. With this events, we open up a completely new world. So that's why I really like your three steps, Lucas, that you highlighted. A, yep. is the data already in Dynatrace? And if not, how do we get it in? We have different ways to get it in through extensions, through an API. There's different ways you can get now data to Dynatrace and, and on top of what we used to have. Uh, the second step is, uh, you have the data. How do you get the answers through DQL? And then how can you make it easier available through a custom app? And that's, I think now folks start building and uh, go crazy. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. Lucas, I'll sure have you back, but thank you for this episode. All right. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.